good afternoon. Thanks all for attending. Um, uh, this is, as you know, is, is the political panel of, of the day. Um, we, uh, the format is pretty much just going to be a freewheeling Q&A. So um, if anybody of you have seen the ABC's Q&A program. <laughs> no. Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Think of me as Tony Jones, but without, without the salary. <laughs> and without much of the talent. <laughs> but anyway. Um, so I work with these, this lot here uh, in, in Parliament House and um, my job is to try and keep them in check, so I'll try and do the same thing uh, today. I'm the Herald State Political Editor. Ding! Round one! <laughs> <laughs> so um, I should do some intros actually. Um, Robert Brown from the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party. Um, Paul Green from the Christian Democrats Party. Minister Niall Blair. Um, uh, National Party. <laughs> from, from, sorry, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Ryan Park. From the National Party, Ryan Park from Labor and uh, Justin Field from the Greens. He's actually David Shoebridge in disguise. Oh, <laughs> here we go, start it up. I, I, thought, I thought we could open with just a, a very general overview of uh, the political landscape in New South Wales, particularly as it relates to uh, rural and regional New South Wales. And this will be no surprise to any of you that as we draw closer to the 2019 New South Wales election, um, the, the tone of politics worldwide has pretty much translated into uh, on-the-ground politics in New South Wales and Australia more broadly. We're seeing the rise of minor parties uh, who are knocking off the majors uh, in very unexpected ways with, you know, with very loud, shrill policies which throws up um, uh, particular challenges for the establishment and, and New South Wales is no exception. So the landscape in New South Wales is that the, the coalition currently has 53 seats in a 93 in a seat parliament. That means that it can go into minority government by losing just seven seats in March 2019. The reason rural and regional New South Wales is so important at the moment is that that is where the seats that the ALP and the minor parties are going to be gunning for, in the Shooters and Fishers case, literally. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a unique proposition, I think, in New South Wales, and one that's going to be very interesting. So I thought it was appropriate to open with a, a broad question to that uh, issue, to, uh, to, um, to the minister. Um, minister, um, as I said, it's increasingly obvious that, uh, that the regions are going to be where the next state election uh, could well be won or lost. Um, how much of a panic is the government in? <laughs> we're listening. We're, we're not panicking. Um, we're just getting on with what we should be doing and, and making sure that uh, regional New South Wales is getting its fair share. I think uh, everything that... Uh, that this audience has seen from particularly the time that I've been minister, that we're not uh, sitting around and waiting for an election cycle. Um, absolutely, regional New South Wales should be the focus. And, and from where I sit, it shouldn't take uh, the tightness of the polls to make that the focus. You don't live in a regional community. You don't um, be born in a regional community. You don't have a business in a regional community like myself and the rest of my colleagues, colleagues in my party room have without understanding that regional New South Wales needs its fair share and, and that's our focus. And I think even you, Sean, could acknowledge that uh, what we've seen in the budget that we've just handed down is that's exactly what's happening in New South Wales. This is not uh, the last budget before the election. This is the budget now in 2017, a big focus on the region's record sp spending where it needs to be and, uh, and that's our focus. We're not panicking. We're just getting on and, and, uh, and making the right decisions and the politics will take care of itself. So just to stick on that for a second, I mean, you lost the leader of the Nationals uh, following the loss of Orange at the by-election. The message that immediately came out was we've lost touch with the regions. So, I mean, do you agree with that proposition? And if so, what are you going to do to fix it? Well, I think... Again, if I look at the budget that we handed down a few weeks ago, and if we start to compare some of the policy settings that are particularly directed to the audience here today and some of the things that I spoke about in my speech, 
uh, you'll see that uh, we're, we're well and truly heading in the right direction for regional New South Wales. And the only thing that stands uh, between the prosperity, particularly our farmers, can enjoy um, post-2019 are those that, uh, that put that at risk. And it's those that have uh, policy um, platform and framework that uh, are direct threat to the productivity, the sustainability, but also the role that farmers play in New South Wales. That's what we're offering. Um, and who would, that, who would that be, Minister? Well, um, it's interesting. Both of them are to my right, the two, the two top two. Um, we've got uh, the Labor Party that have made a clear decision that they will rip up our biodiversity uh, legislation. Um, they've made that commitment on the record, not only in the, uh, in the debate, but also in, in Luke Foley's address and reply, reply speech. I, you know, we've got uh, Ryan here with us that, um, that uh, is the shadow treasurer, and I'd be very interested to see what Labor would be offering up in ERC for our farmers of the state. And then Justin's from the Greens, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> OK, we'll, we'll, we'll allow them a right, to, right of reply in a second. But I, I wanted to steer the conversation to, to Mr Brown here because, of course, it was his party who had that famous victory in Orange and then flush with, the, uh, with, with success set about declaring that they were going to knock rule, off... Rule the world, is knock that off, oh, Yeah, well, pretty much knock off gnats across <laughs> New South Wales. And uh, uh, so... Um, Robert, um, you just heard what the Minister said about uh, reconnecting, what the government was doing for regional New South Wales. Um, I'd like your view on that. But also, I'd like to ask you, why should regional New South Wales voters even look at you, uh, given that, you know, uh, you, we could cynically say that you tacked on the name Farmers to your, to your party name just, just recently? Yes, we did. Um, which suggests that... Perhaps, you know, it suggests to some people that you might not have had a long, long standing commitment here. And you're going to be up against a, a party in the Nationals which has a long standing and proven track record of looking after the bush. Uh, w what's your argument for why people should vote for you? Well, <clears throat> uh, just prior to the, uh, uh, the Orange by election, we were running around saying Brexit, Trump, Donato. And uh, it happened, didn't it? So <clears throat> my answer to that one, Sean, would be. <clears throat> The Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party is the fifth largest political party in Australia by representation. One seat ahead of Pauline Hanson at the moment. Um, so we're not just uh, what we were in 1992, a single issue ginger group. Uh, we have matured. Secondly, there's nothing like reality uh, to set the scene for talking about what might be and what might not be. Orange was a reality. Now, yes, we only won Orange by 55 votes, by the narrowest of margins. But you'd have to say, particularly if there's any people from, from that electorate in the, in the room today, that there was a mood at that election to, uh, well, maybe to give the Nationals a black eye. So we're not in government and we will never be in government. The way we run our game is by being in a position to put our boot heels on the throats of those who are. Now, if that sounds brutal and a bit a bit rough around the edges, that's the way it's got to be. Um, in this current parliament, for example, it's not the shooters, fishers and farmers who have the balance of power in the upper house, it's the Christian Democrats. Kratz. Christian Democrats are far more gentlemanly and gentle than what we are, but they have the same opportunity uh, to, um, you know, to make sure that government makes the right decisions. Now, I know uh, it's, it's, it's a political forum, so I guess I can say this. We go out there and we tell the electorate, yes, the National Party probably does their damnedest, their hardest, to support you. I also say that if the National Party, Australia-wide, had been doing their job for the last 30 years, there never would have been a John Tingle, there never would have been a Pauline Hanson, etc., etc., etc. So there is a lot of gr groups of people out there uh, who have uh, made uh, politics in the world, not just in, in Australia or in New South Wales, other than a two-party game. Even the Greens, going from 1995, okay. you have to argue they did all I'll just interrupt you there. But you make a good point, and to that point, um, uh, the, the, the rise of the minor parties, and in particular Pauline Hanson, um, I, mean, I know the CDP regards itself as having quite a strong track record in the regions. I, I wanted to ask you, Paul Green, what, what your take on, on this rise, I mean, you are a minor party, but that presents particular challenges for you as a minor party if there's a, if there's a force 
such as Pauline Hanson's One Nation crashing the stage in New South Wales? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question and uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, Paul Green, uh, I, I did uh, live on a farm where my dad was a farmer, a milker, a uh, dairy farm, and, and he uh, was a man of the bush, uh, putting up a lot of fences and clearing out a lot of gullies. Uh, so I know what it is to, to uh, the expectations of the farmers and the challenges of the vegetation and, and uh, running the farm on a daily basis. Secondary, um, that, we bring that experience to the CDP uh, so I, we've done that and of course my counterpart, the Reverend the Honourable Fred Nile, uh, has been a great supporter of the farmers, uh, New South Wales farmers, and I think that's on the record since 1981 when he entered uh, uh, politics in New South Wales. Uh, of course, uh, back in 1997, I think you might, if you, uh, if you were around uh, in, in political terms back then, the first lot of native veg came from the Labor Party and Fred was asked uh, by the New South Wales farmers to move 40 amendments. 40 amendments because the Liberal National Party would not move them. And he moved the whole 40, took six hours. And he did that because your local party would not do that. Now, that's who the CDP is. We've got your back. We support farmers. We will watch you. And when the major parties let you down, we are there for you. We've been entrusted with the balance of power. And I think we've honoured you with that. So much so that we've started uh, stuck with the shooters and fishers. Uh, with the native vegetation abolishing uh, of that act, we the four of us were sitting there alone on the other side of the chamber because we were sitting on your behalf and we weren't worried about what the political uh, ramifications were within our parties. Uh, the third thing, which is coming to the question, if I could, is Pauline Hanson uh, has uh, pushed into the political atmosphere, and that is dangerous for New South Wales farmers, in, in my view is that if she's able to push through and get the statistics and get people into the uh, upper house in 2019 with the balance of power, what history have they got with New South Wales farmers? CDP has a history of backing you and, getting, and being your wicket keeper where no one else will stick with you. And now the shooters and fishers have, have joined with us doing that. So the danger for us, Sean, is if people start to elect someone from one nation or another party that doesn't have the historical knowledge the, the faithfulness of joining with you along the fight, you will be left short of someone in the ring in 2019. Okay. Um, I might now go to the, to, to the two uh, so, so described dangerous MPs down the end there that are too dangerous to me. <laughs> uh, Ryan Park from the Labor Party. Um, it's, it's kind of a weird, given the focus on the regions, it's a bit of a strange election for the ALP given that its focus has very much been metropolitan um, and that's where the, the vast majority of your seats are held. I don't, do you have a country Labor member at the moment? Uh, yes, we've got a couple of country Labor members. Mick Veach is obviously um, a strong advocate for yeah, country so, Labor, particularly... In the, in the LA? Uh, yeah, Jenny Atchison, Kate yes. Washington, okay. so, yeah. Right. So, I mean, does it... What... what how important are the regions to Labor this, this time around then, um, given, given what's already going on in that space? Do you just sit back and let it happen and, and, and watch, the, watch the coalition get smashed up, or do you have something a bit more positive to say about it? No, and, and firstly, can I uh, thank everyone uh, and Kathleen for the invitation to be here today. It's uh, very important and um, I appreciate you all taking uh, the time. No, the reality is I, I come from Wollongong. Uh, I don't come from a farm, farming family, neither have I worked on a farm. So I, I, I don't like politicians who stand up and say there's something because some generation within their family did something. So no, I don't. Um, so uh, regional, regional, regional New South Wales uh, is critical. A big show. And, and that is the reality of it. Uh, the minister is right in saying that regional New South Wales shouldn't just be a priority based on polls, it should be a priority in general, because you are the people who feed us, you produce an enormous amount of our GDP, you are the people who uh, help keep our land the way it is, and you are the people who we rely on to ensure our economies are strong. The problem is, Sean, at the moment, uh, and we could say it's been a criticism of major parties in the past, and that would be a fair one. The problem is at the moment is that a commitment was given by the government to allocate 30% of the restart New South Wales funding. That's funding that was generated from the sale of large community owned assets to go to regional New South Wales. Now that in itself is a fairly strong commitment. 
the reality is in 1516, only 10% of that went to regional New South Wales. So there is a great divide at the moment, and it's, it's not just the range. There is a great divide between the money that is spent in and around where we are now and in and around regional and rural New South Wales. I think that is that, a reality. I think, I think to be fair, Ryan, um, the government has certainly stuck by that commitment and, and, and its position is that those funds will indeed be rolling out in due course. It just hasn't you know, got to that level yet. Well, look, the government had a commitment to ban greyhounds. It opposed, it eventually fell on that. The government had a commitment to ban or con merge local councils. It seems to be falling on that. Uh, the government had a commitment to bring in a fantastic new tax called the emergency services levy. It flipped on that. I mean, we have a flipping government at the moment and we're just waiting to see what the next one is. But we will wait and see and we hope, we hope for regional New South Wales' sake, we hope for regional New South Wales' sake that that money starts to flow. But no political party can survive in New South Wales and no political party can govern in New South Wales, to be perfectly blunt, mm. unless you are talking, listening and acting for rural and regional New South Wales. That is the reality, and that's the reality that face the Coalition. It's the reality that faces the Labor Party. All right, thanks, Ryan. Um, now, uh, Justin, um, this in some ways can be a bit of a hard room for you to be in. The Greens are traditionally uh, a bit of a whipping boy for, um, for farmers on particular issues, um, but I'm sure, I'm sure you'd disagree with that. Um, how would you describe the Greens' relationship with men and women on the land, working men and women on the land, and, um, and, and, and how, how, do you, how do you connect with them? What do, what do you have to offer? What do the Greens have to offer? Thanks, Sean. Um, can I also start by um, apologising on behalf of Jeremy Buckingham, who's been a, quite a tireless activist um, and advocate for Is regional just generally communities? Or? <laughs> Absolutely. I apologise generally for Jeremy Buckingham. He can't be here today, he's overseas. <laughs> But his name will be known to most people in this room. And we talk a lot about Orange, um, and I understand the significance of Orange, but uh, just a couple of years before that, it was the Greens breaking through in the national heartland uh, of the North Coast, in Ballina and also almost in Lismore. So the myth that uh, the Greens and regional communities and the Greens and farmers can't work together has been totally broken down. Um, I come from regional Queensland. Um, I grew up... Uh, in and around the cane fields of central Queensland and had a, uh, grew up on a pawpaw and mango farm before our farm was compulsorily acquired for the shale oil industry. I have a lot of skin in this game. I understand the impacts of people on the land from the resource conflict. And of course, we have seen how greens and farmers can work together in that space over the last few years. That's built genuine relationships between uh, our members and activists and people on the land. We have a really important um, uh, a shared uh, concern about the impacts of climate change. People on the land will feel that most and most strongly, and there is going to be a need for us to work together to manage those impacts um, on the land. Um, farmers have a positive role to play when it comes to mitigating against the impacts of climate change in regards to ensuring that our, uh, you know, the, the opportunities for uh, investment, um, supporting farmers financially to be part of the positive solutions when it comes to uh, tree cover, um, carbon sequestration, renewable energy, the income streams that that offer. There's a lot of positive things on the Greens platform that I think interest people on the land, absolutely. Terrific. Um, I might just stick with you. We want to quickly move through some specific issues and you mentioned the, uh, the, the biodiversity laws. Um, I think just about everybody in this room would have a very keen interest in the changes uh, that, that went through Parliament uh, recently. Um, uh, I think the government, it's fair, would be very proud of what happened, but um, the Greens were quite critical of those changes. Can you just explain why you feel that the, the land clearing laws in particular um, are, are, are not as positive as the government is making out? Well, at the end of the day, um I've, I've been on the land a lot in the last few years with, um, uh, with the coal and gas campaign in particular. I know farmers are acutely aware of the environmental impacts of what they do and, and want to ensure that the environment is protected. There's a really direct relationship between a healthy environment, clean air, clean water, protecting biodiversity. Um, those things are uh, important for, um, for landholders, they're custodians of that land as well. We have a, a shared responsibility when it comes to managing those things and the consequences of the changes to the Na Native Vegetation Act 
um, are that we will go backwards in terms of um, protecting biodiversity, which is under threat in a whole range of ways. But I think farms also recognise that there's a double standard that's been applied um, by governments here. We've got um, coal mines and gas companies that seem to be able to freely just clear land. And there was a real frustration that the rules weren't um, applied uh, in an equitable way. We think we could have um, not uh, torn up the Native Vegetation Act and, and, and looked at those specific concerns that landholders had because we have to collectively manage that shared resource, um, which is our environment, in a way that can manage the impacts of climate change, you know, water movement on properties, the salinity issues, biodiversity. We have to share the responsibility and the burden. Okay. And the Greens were very active at ensuring that um, the, 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 the aims of the Local Land Services Bill would enable farmers to be paid for the contribution that they make to protecting biodiversity. That's something I don't think the government has fully taken up okay. and something we'll have to do in the future. Well, just, we'll, get, we'll give the Minister a chance to respond in a minute, but I know Mr Brown's got pretty strong views on, on this. Um, I mean, what, what, what is your view of, uh, of, those, of the land clearing changes? Well, at the end of the day, we supported the government's uh, biodiversity bill because a an honourable man and the bloke I trust convinced me that it was probably the best thing to do, and that's the, the minister sitting here. We trust him. Uh, <clears throat> but you have to remember that uh, a year before that, or a year and a half before that, the New South Wales farmers came to the shooters, fishers and farmers and asked us to run a bill to do away with the Native Vegetation Act. And we were supported by the Christian Democrats. Now, there was a lot of talk going around about how it couldn't be done legally, blah de blah de blah de blah but, but our, um, we have as equal access to the parliamentary council, which are the lawyers, as everybody else does, so we knew that we, we, were, we were right. In our view, uh, the, the, uh, the panel is still out on, on whether or not the biodiversity laws will work. You can't just make a law, generally speaking, and overnight it makes a difference. Bad laws you can, I'll tell you. So it's really only been quick. six months or something, hasn't it? Yeah. So, so let's give it a bit of time. OK. I, I, we, we think that the government, though, uh, is not really playing uh, the, the, full, the full game here. Uh, E-zones, environmental zones over production lands and residential lands are exactly the same in terms of their effect of the Native Vegetation Act. Why didn't they do that at the same time? Well, I might put so that to the minister and, and ask him to, to just give a general response to what you've heard there. Yeah, the issue of e-zones is something that we're working um, on at the moment because we think that planning rules in regional New South Wales need to be um, different to what you, you have here in Sydney. So we've, we're looking at a SEP that uh, addresses that issue. In relation to the biodiversity um, laws and the law changes, and I hear what Justin said, you can't say, oh, we believe the farmers uh, are good people and they're able to manage land and they care about air and water without then backing that up and making them part of the solution. That's right. So what we've got here is a, a fundamental problem with property rights. Whereas the previous Native Vegetation Act said, we're going to take the benefit of that vegetation for the greater good of the people of New South Wales and you're not going to be allowed to touch it You'll have no say in what we do. We're going to lock it up and then you get to pay for the ramifications of that. You get to control the pests and the weeds that come out of it. And you know what? It didn't work. More species ended up on the uh, endangered list under that Act. Anyone that stood in a piece of invasive native species, a monoculture, you are overwhelmed by the deafening silence. There is not biodiversity living in those areas. We have said, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. We started with the property right. We started with the property right and we said the farmers need to be part of that solution. So back it up. You've got a resource. Back it up. And here we go to the resourcing question. Hundreds of millions of dollars through the Saving Our Species, uh, $28 million to, to allow LLS to gear up. LLS, LLS, the organisation that is different to any other agency within government, 11 different regions, representation from people in your communities that you get to vote for, people that are employed on the ground to come out and say to the farmer, first and foremost, if you're going to help the greater good of the people of New South Wales by the native vegetation on your property, well, let's work with you to see if you can also get some productivity gains out of, out of that. What would you like to do? Can we, can we help the environment by making 
your spray routine more efficient so you're using less diesel and less chemicals to get around single paddock trees? Can we make sure that you manage that native vegetation through grazing so you can get a profitability uplift, but also not then have to then get the burden of pests and weeds as a result of putting a fence around it? Let's make farmers part of the solution. That is the fundamental change here. We're still going through all the technical changes and, and the implementation, but I'm confident because we've backed LLS with the funding to do this. But let's go back to the very first principle. This is a property rights issue that we said, no, we disagree with what Labor did. And there's a clear choice. These guys want to go back to that. They want to tell you what to do on your land, more importantly, what you can't do on your land. And we said, we're not going to stand for that. I might just get a quick response from Ryan Park on, on because as you say, they were Labor's laws that you, you overturned. Um, but Ryan, what do you say about yeah, that? We have uh, different views to the government uh, on this and maybe different views uh, to people in this room. I'm not going to walk away from that. Um, I find in, on panels like this, politicians stand up here and try and uh, milky way through a proposal that they've supported. I'm not going to do that. That's a decision we made. That's it. Um, that's our view on it. So um, that's where we stand. Uh, however, LLS, uh, I will talk about that. Uh, there's been cuts to staffing of LLS, in, in, ironically an increase in their corporate staff, but a cut to their frontline staff. So the implementation of these reforms is certainly questionable. Uh, that's certainly been an issue that uh, Mick Veach has raised on behalf of many landowners. And um, we will be certainly having some things to say about the future of LLS uh, going forward sooner rather than later. OK. Yeah, very quickly. I'll just see if Mr Green wants to have something to say. Um, the issue of staffing with LLS, I know Ryan probably doesn't subscribe to the land in, in Wollongong, but anyone that's seen those jobs that are being advertised, we, are, we have put more resources into LLS. We will have more boots on the ground through LLS and continue to have those staffing numbers increasing. So uh, playing uh, little, little games on numbers is not the, the right uh, answer or the, the actual, um, the actual situation that we have in New South Wales. We are continuing to uplift LLS and also an increase to the, to the recurrent expenditure of the, of, the of the budget that we just delivered as well. Okay, so, thanks. Paul, Paul, what do you think? Look, I, I just want to reply what um, uh, Mr Park said. Uh, you know, it virtually, is, virtually says this is our opinion and you guys can you know, go get stuffed. Basically, <laughs> I'll tell Fred you said that. <laughs> I'm only Shocking. saying what I've heard. Shocking. I, look, I'm I'm of the firm believer, being from a regional area, and a, a, you know, with a lot, worked with a lot of farmers down the south coast uh, with lots of challenges. But seriously, it's not one size fits all. All your farms are different, and what you're trying to achieve may be different. Uh, secondly, consult first, write the damn laws second. Thirdly, why is the state sterilising your productive property? Let them run it for a day and see just how damn hard that is. OK, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'll have to start using bad language too. Oh, it, it wasn't Feel bad. Free. Was that bad language? Um, I apologise if it is. Um, now, I, I'd like to move um, to a big, a big story that broke last week, which no doubt most of you would have heard about, and that's the decision by the New South Wales Government to grant an exploration licence to the Shenhua Watermark coal mine in the Liverpool Plains. Um, you might have seen, or maybe even heard, uh, Alan Jones um, uh, giving our Premier Gladys Berejiklian a bit of a, a what for on his radio program over that decision. Um, Noel Blair, it, it seems like almost nobody is happy about this other than the, the Chinese owned miner itself. Um, despite the government highlighting that there will be no mining on the prime agricultural land, like the black, the black soils, um, thanks to you paying a quarter of a million dollars or upwards of a quarter of a million dollars to buy back part of that licence. That was cheap. Billion. Quarter billion. My, my mistake, sorry. <laughs> that would have been cheap. <laughs> why, why, why did your government allow uh, an exploration licence at all? And doesn't this risk a huge uh, electoral backlash? Well, let's go back to the, to the start of uh, these projects where Labor at the time handed out the exploration licences and took $300 million up front for the luxury to do so. Um, 
The government, uh, the government has made a decision based both on the proposed uh, BHP uh, project and also now Shenhua to, to uh, one, take the EL uh, off the BHP project and reduce the size of the existing Shenhua one um, by about 51%. And uh, that puts the farmers in that area in a better situation t today than where they were last week or last year. And uh, there is still a long way for that process to go in relation to whether a mine does or not does not uh, proceed. Uh, that's a process that's not managed uh, by, my, by my agency, um, and that will, will run its course. But in order to make sure that the certainty around those black soil plains was uh, was guaranteed for the farmers in that area, a decision was made to reduce that EL, and the money that's gone back to them um, is uh, is coming out of the same money that they gave up front to the government. So it's $260 million that, that you're paying. Um, I mean, it, it, is this just a... That's a lot of money to pay just to, get you, to try and get yourselves out of, a, out of a nasty political situation. Oh, this is, this is not about getting out of situations because if it was, uh, if it was that simple, you would just, um, you know, make other decisions. But the Well, the, the other decision on... that you could have made, that the government could have made, is just to say, well, I'm sorry um, you're out of time on, on this uh, application. Um, see you later. And uh, the decision was made to uh, take back the EL over the black soil. Um, the 260 million is 2017 equivalent dollars uh, to the percentage of what was paid up front to the government. So uh, based on the same formula that was used uh, for the BHP, uh, it comes out at 51% and in 2017 dollars that's uh, what it equated to. Do you, um, think is, farmers, is, do you think farmers in general are happy with this approach to coal mining given that it's a red hot topic across the state? I think it's an interesting exercise um, and being in the National Party it's, it's one that uh, it's very different on what parts of the state that you go to and what types of, of mining you talk about. You know there's gypsum and lime and, and other uh, other uh, minerals that are extracted that are, yeah, that are coal, very coal, I think, is the and you know, <laughs> the focus, some, yeah. and what I'm saying is it depends on where you are and what type of extraction that's happening as to what the mood of that community is. And um, I'm sure that there are people uh, on both sides of the argument that will look at this and say <coughs> it's either not enough or it's it's too much. Um, but again, a lot of people might look at it and say, well, okay, it's better than what it was the, the week before, the month before, the year before. Mm. That doesn't mean we don't continue to work through uh, the issues. Uh, the agencies that I have are responsible for monitoring things like groundwater, uh, making sure that the, the standards, the rules, all of those issues are examined um, and the science are examined and fed into the agencies that will make those decisions. In the National Party, we can't just say yes or no for this issue. It's very much about where in the state you are, the types of industries that you're talking about and uh, the types of communities that, uh, that have that support. I've always used the rule that uh, when people come in to lobby me or talk to me about an issue, that they're talking to the wrong person. Once you convince the people that put me in parliament that it's okay, then it's okay. Right? And that's the big problem we have. A lot of people come to us and say, you've got to stop this or you've got to do this. Well, you're elected. I, I will. I will. I will listen to my constituents or the people that are affected in those communities. And when they tell me it's okay, that's then we'll, we'll, that's uh, when we'll go. You're saying that, that the people in those communities are telling you that this decision is okay? Oh, what I'll tell you is the people in those communities have very different views on where you are and whether you're a farmer uh, on the Liverpool Plains or whether you're maybe a tradesperson or a, or a business based in Gunnedah. And, and we've seen that this issue has popped up at a number of elections, both <coughs> state and federal. And we've seen the diversity in views between Tamworth or the Liverpool Plains and Gunnedah. Okay. So what I'm saying is this is, this is an issue that uh, um, is a better situation today than what it was last week, but it's still an issue and we'll continue to work through that. Okay. The Greens have been very critical of this, uh, no surprise there, but surely Justin feel it can be argued that the government has gone out of its way to protect the most important aspect. Um, of, of this whole discussion, and that's the Liverpool Plains prime agricultural land, the black soils. The land only works when it's got water. Um, so what we've seen is half a billion dollars, half a billion dollars <laughs> has been paid. Yeah. That'll store it for some time, but half a billion dollars 
pay when you look at uh, Shenhua and Karuna to not solve the land use conflict uh, in New South Wales and particularly um, in the New England area. And, um, and, and when you watch uh, the, the conversations that happened over the last week, very little was said about the water. So you can, you can, you can move the mine up onto the ridgelands, but that doesn't deal with the water that it's going to use. No one um, doubts the, uh, the, the, the jobs that will be created, the economic opportunities for regional communities when it comes to energy development. But it doesn't need to be coal and gas. Niall just said um, the National Party doesn't get its own way, and that is the point. They seem beholden to the Liberal Party when it comes to energy and resources policy in this state. We could actually see a renewable energy future that would deliver more jobs, a more long-term uh, economic future for not just the towns in regional New South Wales, but also landholders when it comes to uh, wind and solar. That's the direction we should be heading. This debate needs to be put to bed sooner rather than later. I don't know why the government has allowed this to continue. Um, I think Labor's position of no Shenhua is a good one. They didn't need to have the money um, uh, paid back, I don't think, by our law. But then the question for Labor is where do you sit on the other greenfield projects uh, in the Bylong Valley and okay. the Southern Highlands? So the Greens have been really consistent on this. I think it's one of the clear areas where we are on the side of landholders and regional communities in New South Wales. All right. I just might move it along to a related subject um, of co gas and coal seam gas. Um, and I'd like to direct this to Ryan Park initially. Um, Labor has promised a moratorium on any new coal seam gas uh, activity. I think until the, I think that the phrase is along the lines of until the science proves it's safe. Um, and it's also you, you've also promised to ban CSG activity in the Pilliga altogether where Santos has a potential $2 billion gas field. Yet the chief scientist of New South Wales, Mary O'Kane, has already been through all of this essentially. And her report, considered study, found that um, uh, this industry could proceed as long as the right safeguards are in place. So I guess the question is, why, does, why doesn't Labor trust the science? Well, let me say uh, from the outset, people on this panel don't like me talking, frankly. Well, I'll continue to do it. Labor stuffed, Labor stuffed this up. Labor stuffed this up. Um, so Labor got this wrong in terms of CSG policy uh, at the back end of 2010. Uh, I can say quite strongly that uh, in my neck of woods of the Illawarra, it's been a huge problem uh, because it is right smack bang was going to be proposed in our water catchment area. And uh, that raises enormous concerns from me. Uh, I uh, led the charge against it. I thought Labor got it wrong at the time. I've said repeatedly, publicly and privately, we got this wrong. Uh, I acknowledge, I acknowledge uh, that the government has made progress on this, but it's not about trusting the science or not, Sean. It's about whether you start to prioritise the land over CSG and water catchment and reserves over CSG. As someone who was uh, a Chief of Staff to a Water Minister during a time uh, where we had great, great drought and we're seeing huge, our, our dams drop very, very quickly every single week, uh, water security is something that is important to me. It's important to the community that I represent. I'm sure it's important to many, many people here. So, uh, yes, we are concerned about the cumulative impacts that CSG has, particularly when it's combined with other industries in sensitive areas such as the water catchment areas. So not to take away what Mary O'Kane or whatever um, and others are saying, it's simply saying that at the moment we have very, very big concerns about this new and emerging industry and whether it can sit uh, in an effective way in some of these sensitive areas that it's been proposed. Okay, thanks. Um, Minister, um, the government recently announced that it was essentially going to restart the, the gas, the process of maybe allowing gas companies back in um, uh, by asking for expressions of interest in Western New South Wales, around Broken Hill and Wilcannia. How far do you expect this to go? I mean, is, this, is the industry going to be, you know, allowed to let rip again? And just a, a related question, um, why won't the government give farmers the right to refuse access to their own land? Good question. Um, in relation to, to the western uh, part of the state, uh, Sean, it's, a, it's an area that's not in my portfolio and, and, uh, and I probably can't shed too much light on, on, uh, on what you're asking there. 
Uh, well, to that question then, I mean, I think it was Barnaby Joyce who, who expressed the view that uh, farmers really should be allowed to say no, to, to lock the gate. Um, why doesn't the New South Wales Nationals agree with that? Or Good do man, you? that Barnaby. Good man. I, uh, I, Barnaby expresses a lot of views and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> it, uh, and, they, and, uh, and not, not only publicly like we saw today in his address this morning, but also uh, very much privately to me as well. Uh, he has my number and he uses it. So uh, um, in but, relation but Can to you address that issue? Or why, why, why will the New South Wales government consider allowing farmers to lock the gate? And if not, why? Well, I mean, this is something that uh, we've had a long history on uh, since we came into government in 2011, uh, 2011, off the back of what Ryan was just saying that uh, they, they gifted us. Um, what we've done is make sure that in areas of the state like the Northern Rivers, uh, again, we've taken back those exploration licences because the communities have said they don't want it. But there again, in other parts of the state where some of the communities are more accepting of it, and again, some of them are looking to this, potentially when we're looking at some of the input costs that, uh, that our farmers in particular and our small regional communities and businesses are facing when it comes to energy. And, uh, and that's again, it's, uh, if, you're, if you're looking for me just to um, take a decision to say it's black or white, that's not how regional New South Wales works. That's the challenges that we get in a state with the diversity of climatic and growing conditions, uh, the geographic size of it, the demographics of our communities. It's, it's again, that issue that uh, even Paul said, it shouldn't be you know, one size fits all. People should be able to have a look at their enterprises. And, uh, and that's what we've done in relation to access on, onto farms. Um, plenty of people say the same thing about wind, windmills. Mm, you know. We've worked with New South Wales farmers in relation to MOUs about access, uh, and that's something that, uh, again, we continue to, to talk about. Robert Brown, what do you think about uh, the idea of allowing farmers to say no? Uh, well, if you have a look at our policies on the website, one of the headline policies is absolute private property rights. The key word there is absolute. Now, just to uh, sort of put this in perspective, Alan Jones has been rabbiting on endlessly about, uh, you know, the, the uh, the, the imbalance in equity in the people in Ackland. Uh, of course, he comes from that area, so he's got a personal interest. The farmers around Ackland historically had rights, mineral rights, below their properties. So New Hope very, very cleverly bought up all the, bought up all the properties because they then bought the, bought the mineral rights. In New South Wales, I think, I might be wrong historically, and I'll stand corrected if I'm, around about 1920 or probably before, that it might have been around the turn of the century, uh, mineral rights below your land was removed from you uh, and vested in the Crown or vested in the state. Now, our, our policy is clear, and it's not all that popular necessarily uh, right across rural New South Wales, but it is, we say, you don't lock the gate, you don't open the gate, you have the choice to open or lock your gate. Okay. Whether it's a windmill, whether it's a coal seam gas, whether it's a coal mine, or whether it's a rail trail. Okay. But Paul Green, is, is that the CDP's policy or is it...? Well, look, I think uh, the Minister answered uh, quite extensively about it, but look, I guess the way CDP sees it, it's your property and you're, you're trying to make the best of your life and your yield of your property and you're trying to maximise what it can produce. I think, yeah, you, know, you know what's best for your property and you know what you do or don't want on it. There's, you know, some things are permissible that, that uh, you know, sorry, some things may be, all, all things might be possible, but that doesn't mean they're permissible. And what we need to be careful of is we don't stuff the water supply up, because if you stuff that up, you stuff the rest of the stuff up for generations to come. So we would be of a mind that, you know, the right thing's done the right way in the right order, and I think Mary O'Kane has addressed that. But the question always comes back to the end. If you stuff the water supply, you're stuffing it possibly for generations to come. Okay. Um, Justin, I think we pretty much know your position, but if you just want to have a quick, very quick response. Very quick. Uh, whatever you do on your property, whether it be a residential block or a, a, a piece of farming land, it impacts on your neighbours. It can impact even are. more broadly when it comes to water security. Ocean. So I, I think that is something we actually have to come to terms with as a society, through our governments, through organisations like New South Wales Farmers. But let's not ignore what has happened with the coal seam gas debate. The opening up of the export industry to justify the development of the coal seam gas uh, extraction industry has driven up power prices 
for everyone. That impacts on farmers, that impacts on, on, um, on food production in this country in a really dramatic way. It's been a total failure of industry policy driven by conservative governments primarily, but Labor have been complicit in this at the national and at the state level. We have to get control of our energy policy if we're going to change the circumstances for people who are consuming energy and also being impacted upon by energy developments on their property. Thank you. Um, well, I'd like to raise the guns issue um, in light of the New South Wales government's recent um, decision uh, to support the reclassification of the Adler shotgun, um, or a, a type of Adler shotgun, uh, to category D, a very restrictive category. Uh, basically, I think this is right, Robert Brown, for basically professional purposes. Yeah. Um, category D is military semi-automatic weapons. So your, your uh, party opposed this. Can you explain why? Yeah, well, we ran uh, 18 pages of amendments to the government's bill and we kept them there till about quarter to three in the morning. That tactic we learned from the Greens. Thank you, Justin. <laughs> so, but look, um, our policy when it comes to firearms is pretty much the same as our policy when it comes to you running your own lives, running your own farms. And that is, get off our backs and leave us alone. The Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party doesn't believe that every man jack of us should have a... Uh, 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 an MP10 or a semi-automatic or a fully automatic machine gun hanging around their neck. That's not where we're at. We object to over-regulation. And uh, you know, you, 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 I mentioned to you before, we've got a bit of regulation floating around this room. My man Stephen Lars is standing over there, very academic looking bloke, uh, has, <laughs> has bought, some, has bought some, um, uh, some bad news into the room. Um, if you're a farmer and you want to let someone onto your property, let's say it's a contractor, how do you think you'd feel about giving a government department your name, your age, your sex, your firearms licence number, your driver's licence number and a whole lot of other details? I don't think you'd be real happy about that interference in you running your business, yet that's what is proposed by the New South Wales government when it comes to handing out permission to allow people onto your property to shoot. Now, do you want to address that, uh, Mr Blair? Do you know what he's talking about? I haven't seen the form. Um, I've but it's uh, sorry about that, Noel. That's all right. It's it's a it's again it's an important issue that uh, we did accept uh, the changes that were made at a federal uh, level in relation to firearms regulation, and I think again the balance is is uh, is right. There's uh, uh, there is the need to make sure that our farmers can continue on to get access uh, to the firearms they need for the uh, purposes that they need them on the farm. But for every person that uh, might be upset with, uh, with what Robert's talking about there and giving access. We also get a lot of traffic about those people that have unauthorised access onto farms and, uh, and the trespass issues that come with, with some of the people that do the wrong thing, particularly deal, with the legal... Deal with the trespass issue, don't deal with anything else. Absolutely. And one thing that I have said in discussion with Robert... <laughs> Hang on. ..is as we go through this, although he might have a piece of paper that's proposed there in front of him, the challenge that I've given um, my agencies, and it doesn't matter if it's in uh, the firearm side of things, or whether it's in hunting, or whether it's in fishing, or whether it's in uh, farming, is we need to make sure that, uh, yes, we gather the information that we need to validate permission, etc., that's been granted, but we need to make it in a way that's easy for farmers to access. We need to make it in a way that's easy to validate and we should be looking to things like technology to be able to do this. So this may be a draft of something that I see that's a, a written form. Um, it's an issue that's been raised with us as we're going through the, the regulations for the changes that have been made. And we'll look at seeing how we can make it easier for the farmers. Um, Good. Thank you. Does anybody else want to have a say on the, uh, on the, look, on the, on the issue of guns? Yeah, look, if I can. Uh, look, I, I just want to say, uh, <laughs> people are doing the right things you know, by the government. The government keeps writing laws for those that are doing the wrong things. And the problem is you're never going to trap those people that are using the, uh, ammunition and, and guns for the wrong reason. Only 3% of incidents, in my understanding, about 3% of incident, incidences are happening by those that are registered gun users. 3%. So it means 97% of the other laws we're writing is for the 97% of people that aren't doing the right thing anyway. So why punish the people that are doing the right thing uh, the right way in the right order. I wouldn't mind um, just challenging um, Robert if I could. I, 
You know, I think one of the big concerns for people on the land is um, a pest species in particular, and the shooter's opposition to the declaration of deer as a pest species to enable them to be managed appropriately by governments and cleared off. Talking to you, Mitchell. Seems crazy. This is something, another one of those areas where the Greens are in lockstep with most of the people on the land that I speak to. The declaration of foxes, and in particular deer, would make a big difference to how they are managed. So the shooter's opposition, I, I just, you know... Take with a grain of salt sometimes what the shooters say, the shooters, fishers and farmers, but they will always revert back to their principal objectives and sell out other people to get gains when it comes to shooting and hunting. That's their objective in the parliament. And you know it, and I don't understand the objection to allowing deer to be declared pest species and to be managed appropriately as a pest. It's having a huge impact on the land. Right, you, you can respond to that, Robert, quickly. Okay, hang on, before we get ourselves carried away. <laughs> I've had some very, very serious discussions with your CEO. I've asked him, why has the New South Wales farmers not made your members fully aware of their existing rights under existing legislation? Deer do not need to be declared a pest. Now, the government has sort of done the halfway thing and they are lifting the regulation on how they can be controlled for farmers in eight LGAs. Fine, let's see how that works. But deer were declared a game animal for a specific purpose, same as ducks. Did you know that kangaroos on your property are game animals under the National Parks Act? Same thing. How hard is it for you to get a, a, a sufficient permits to control kangaroos on your place? A bloody lot harder than what it is to get a regulation lifted. So it was an unnecessary, uh, unnecessary thing to do, number one. Number two, the NRC did a very, 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 very bad job of justifying their reasons for doing it. Okay, uh, yes, they I did. think, Mitch, very bad. Yeah, uh, Sean, just on the issue of deer, it's, it's an enormously big problem um, in the escarpment uh, where I'm from, in northern Illawarra. Some of you would be aware that we have a unique model, I think the Minister's aware of it, uh, a northern Illawarra, uh, essentially deer management uh, focus down there. We believe that it has become uh, landowners and rural uh, landowners, particularly in and around the escarpment area, have there wouldn't be a week goes by where I don't get detailed correspondence about uh, the degradation and environmental damage these species are doing. We need additional funding. I'm working on a commitment uh, from my mob to provide additional funding to that setup. But this is an issue uh, that I've had many, many discussions uh, with people on the land about. It is a huge problem an issue that is not going to go away, and the damage that these species do uh, is going to be ongoing. All right, thank you. Any, any other comments? Yep, go for it. Uh, just, just quickly, the, the debate about whether something is declared or not hasn't worked when it comes to pigs and dogs, right? This is about a new way of managing uh, pests and weeds in New South Wales, particularly under the biosecurity uh, legislation that has come into effect on the 1st of July. It's about also, though, making sure that agencies like LLS are geared up with the right resources. And again, we haven't heard the Shadow Treasurer um, deny that we gave increased recurrent funding to LLS to play a, coordinate, a, a coordinator role when it comes to uh, this pest and weed management. That's the approach that we're taking here in New South Wales, and that shouldn't be lost. OK. Uh, look, I might see if... It if anybody wants to put a question to anybody oh, on the this. panel. Here great, go. great, great. So, yes. Could you just introduce yourself, please? Mitchell Clapham, I'm Chair of the Conservation Resource, sorry, the Conservation Resource Management Committee for New South Wales Farmers, particularly interested in the responses on deer. I'd have to ask Robert Brown and uh, the Minister for Primary Industries, why on earth do we declare anything a pest? Um, I cannot understand... Uh, why deer have not been declared a pest when they actually are. The reason that they are declared and kangaroos aren't is because kangaroos are native. We'd love kangaroos to be declared a pest also, but because they're native, that becomes a pretty tricky issue. Deer animal are an introduced animal doing a lot of damage and, and horrendously expensive to a lot of farmers. And it's OK to say that farmers, they don't need to, to be declared a pest uh, to go and destroy them on their own farm becomes a bit tricky when you uh, want to use somebody else to come onto your farm to shoot them and you've got to go and apply to the Game Licensing Board and, and go through all the rigmarole to be able to do it. Look, it's... it's I think, was that, I, was that to the Minister? 
I'll address it to the Minister and uh, Robert yep. Brown because I, I honestly no, believe fine. that it, the decision... We, we've got to move along. Yep. The decision to not declare him a pest is really grounded in politics and not in fact. Thank you. So, so Mitchell, in relation to those provisions and, and some of those controls about, you know, getting help and access, that's exactly what Robert was talking about with the approach that we're taking at localised areas where we know that there are problems, switching off some of those regulations in those eight LGAs to be able to allow that to occur easily. And we don't need to declare them to do that. That's something that we've already done, that's underway, and that's something that uh, we want LLS, again, to look at their regions. What are the issues in their region? A deer management plan, a fox management plan, a dog management plan. What are the issues for your LLS region? Again, take it as far away from Macquarie Street as possible, because look at this, we can't agree, right? But take it to you and your LLS and you come in with the policy that suits your region. That's the approach that we're taking. OK, thank you. I think... Um, yeah, look, I'll talk to you yeah. privately about it, Mitchell. We're not going to waste time here arguing. We'll take a question from this gentleman here and then I've got you at the back there. Yes. Yeah, I think I'm on now. Uh, I'd just like to, to ask the two gentlemen on the left, uh, the Labor Greens Coalition, uh, <laughs> on your left, right? Yeah, it's my left and you're right. But <laughs> yes, you are. I am right. Right. You better believe we're right. Slight, <laughs> this is a slight hypocrisy that you both want to rip up the present Native Vegetation Act. Yet the total destruction of a habitat is right here. Yeah. Concrete and tar are total destructions of a Habitat where farming is carried out can coexist and does coexist with biodiversity. Do you, do you feel that there is a degree of hypocrisy if you allow this to continue to happen? Oh no, we can't. We've got the developers, we'll let them clear and destroy. Yep. And yet farmers who want to just do a little bit of clearing Quite often, a farmer will have two sons and will have some virgin land and they want to clear some. No, no, you can't do that. I think we have the that. question. Thank, Thank you. you. Yep. Just qu very quickly, please. It's gross hypocrisy, um, but it's not, uh, it's not coming from us now. We're dealing with these legacy issues of inappropriate development and whole swag of regions. We were equally opposed to the 1050 laws um, the 1050 code in the city which was going to destroy a lot of the, the, the remnant vegetation that is, exists in and around the city and a lot of the coastal development in particular um, which is destroying coastal habitat which is not only critical from a biodiversity perspective but for protection from the growing impacts from climate change, sea level rise, m increased storm events. It is totally unreasonable. There's a collective responsibility that we all have to protect the biodiversity that remains. Um, I agree to some extent with the Minister. The LLSs play a role in looking at how corridors can be developed and maintained. Resourcing farmers and supporting farmers to do that is important. I think we could have done it under the old laws with the Native Vegetation Act in place. There's going to be some disagreements with people there. It's the outcomes that I think are important. Thank you. Ryan, do you want to say something quickly? Um, look, uh, we, we're going to disagree and that, that's fine. Uh, as I said at the beginning, our concern uh, is with the LLS and the ability for them to manage this and deliver on these reforms. Um, I hope what the Minister says is right and that that is well resourced, well functioning and going to have the ability to be resourced enough to implement these reforms, but we are concerned about that. But uh, there will be things that in forums like this uh, we differ on and that's fine. Uh, there'll be things that uh, we can find similarities on. Thanks. So the gentleman down the back there. Yeah, thank you, Stuart Gore from Moray. Uh, first, thanks, gentlemen, for giving up your time. And um, my question, I guess, is more raised at what uh, Ryan said um, in relating to a government that's doing backflips. I've always been amazed when oppositions of either persuasion come out and say the government's done a backflip. I actually think it's a good thing. It means it's a listening government. Yeah. They've obviously yeah, been ill-informed by these well, bureaucrats. Yeah, great, great. Um, all of a sudden they've made the decision, we've kicked up a stink, they've come back, listened to us, changed their mind. So I wouldn't say a flipping government's a, a bad thing, I'd actually say they're a listening government and they're a good thing. Um, so I just, yeah, wondering your comments on that. Um, uh, I, I'm, 
I'm certainly glad the government listened on greyhounds. I'm certainly glad uh, they listened on local government reform. I'm certainly glad they listened, listened on emergency services taxes. People just said to me, is there certainty around what the government will do? And I said, uh, given in relation to the emergency services levy, uh, not years ago, but just a couple of months ago, the government said this was the proudest area of tax reform it had ever delivered. In the same term of parliament, it has repealed those laws. Uh, but what I'm saying to you is, uh, certainty in government are uh, not two words that go well together at the moment. Uh, so I'm glad they backflipped. Uh, I wish they would have done it without spending <coughs> millions of dollars on advertising. Um, that would have been good. I wish they would have done it without dragging through a whole lot of pain and concern uh, for in relation to the insurance, in relation to people who have land holdings and uh, property holdings. But if you're asking, is it good that they've backflipped? I'm very, very happy that they have. But it was in context that, is there certainty around this going forward? Um, well, given that they've backflipped on a number of reforms that they were very proud to cheer, as late as February this year, call, calling it the most proudest tax reform that they've delivered, what I'm saying is certainty around this is a concern. OK. So We're going to take a question from this gentleman who's next, then this gentleman, and then a lady down the back. <laughs> Thank you. One, one in four Australian citizens are currently voting for an independent party. Australian cit cities are developing at twice the rate of regional Australia. They're, they're raping regional Australia of its youth and young people. <clears throat> I'm fifth generation farmer. Overnight, I could double the production on my farm. Yesterday I spoke about the Constitution. Just compensation would, would enable me to employ people on a full-time basis instead of a part-time. The money would flow back onto my community that, that I make and I'll finish we need a strong national party. And until they stand as an independent party and give their preferences to the Liberals, we won't get the results that regional Australia deserves and this nation to okay. go forward. Thank you. I think that's a good question. I mean, it's just a bit of a challenge to the Nats as a, as a truly independent party standing up for the bush against their coalition partner. We're, we're with him, Niall. <laughs> <laughs> you want to join? <laughs> no, I was going to make a reverse of it. Uh, look, it's certainly an issue that gets raised a lot. I spent two years of being, as being chairman of the National Party here in New South Wales. Uh, that's a decision that structurally uh, is made by our chairman and, uh, and our executive. It's not something that I get to make that decision on at the moment because I'm not that chairman. But uh, between now and whenever that day comes, if it does come, my job is to make sure that while we're in coalition, while we're in government, that I continue to advocate for the communities that I represent. And I think that the fact that we are in, uh, in government, the strong budget, the strong policy settings and decisions that we've got, um, quite often not... Uh, not uh, supported 100% by some of our Liberal Party colleagues, then I think uh, we'll just continue to do what we're doing. Okay. If, uh, just before you go. Could, uh, yeah, if I could just have a quick sure, line just, there. Just very quickly. I yes. think the Minister said earlier, he says, yeah, something about, um, you know, if you keep doing what you're doing and uh, it's not changing, that's the definition of, uh, what did you say? It was... I don't think he said. Yeah, and I said it was the definition of stupidity. And I would say to the people in this room, you keep voting the way you're voting. Uh, that's the definition of stu stupidity if you're not getting the result you expect from your, your uh, parliamentarians. I'll, I'll finish, though, but to, 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 you know, we are, we are at a, a high, right, high level of the, the level of representation that we've got from a national party. Uh, New South Wales has had a very interesting um, history, particularly with a, a, uh, a preferential system that we have here at a state level where uh, previously the two parties, the Liberal and National Party, end up cancelling each other out. My focus is to not allow these guys to get into parliament. We'll come up with whatever model and, and whatever uh, seats we stand in, whether they're Liberal Party or National Party, together to make sure that we keep these guys out of government because they present the biggest risk to what you stand for. 
The two gentlemen to my right will start a race to the bottom on issues like animal welfare, native vegetation, Easy. water storage and water management. It will be a race to the bottom. Mick Veach is a great bloke, but he is the lone ranger. He is the only one that lives west of the Great Divide, and he is one voice in caucus that will get overridden if these guys come into government. So my answer to that question is, whatever system is going to give us the best chance to win government in 2019, that's what we will take. Okay. I just, uh, I'll add my two cents worth. Um, Christian Democrats and shooters, fishers and farmers, we are backflip, backflip brokers. That's what we do. Why do governments backflip? Because they can't get their own way. Secondly, in relation to calling for a split of the Nationals uh, and the Liberals, you, you have a couple of uh, models. Queensland, they're one party. Western Australia, they are in alliance. You'd have to sort of understand what was happening. Yeah, you're being wound up. All right, we've got, I think we've got one more question um, from this gentleman here, and I'm, we're being told that we're out of time, I'm afraid, so sorry about that, madam. Thanks for that. Um, Love talking about backflips and energy agreements and us supporting. I'm from Canamble. We've got a really big problem with uh, coal seam gas. And uh, you know, we, we, let the, we voted for the Nationals or we voted independent, but we voted for no coal seam gas in our, in our district. Now we've got a gas pipeline. And I'm wondering if Niall, why is Santos got so much of a hold on you guys when our community is 95% against coal seam gas? Now you talk about listening to the community, that's 95%. You'll talk to the people at Warren, same thing. We don't want the bloody thing. We don't want Santos giving you guys money to make sure that everyone's happy for this energy agreement of export licences for gas. We just don't want it. We want some answers on it. We want some backflips. Do some good stuff. Uh, Minister. <laughs> Sorry, where were you from again? Look, there's, there's not a lot more to add to the CSG um, that than we haven't already spoken about this afternoon. I'm happy to have a chat to you about Canamble um, uh, once we've, we've wrapped up here. All right, look, I'm, I'm really sorry to the other people who wanted to ask questions, um, but I'm being told that we're out of time and there's a schedule to adhere to. There's so. a little guy up the back that goes like this, which means you've got to he's shut not up. Little. He's, <laughs> not, he's actually not little. The hokey pokey he's, or he's, he's bigger than us, up. so we've got to shut yeah, up. Thank you all for, for your attendance and your great questions. <laughs>